Live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another of our People Behind the Projects webinar series. My name is Dylan. I'm the social media communicator for the Fish and Cat Conservation Alliance. As always, you know, feel free to ask your questions via the Facebook live stream, and we'll get to many of them as we can. Um, we welcome you to ask whatever your heart desires. Before we get started, I wanted to first thank you on behalf of the entire Fish and Cat Conservation Alliance family. Your inspiring engagement during Fish and Cat February was amazing. We are so, so happy. We couldn't have done this without your help, your artwork, your voices, your passion, your interest, and your generous donations, which have already funded amazing number of camera traps. So thank you so, so much. With that, let me introduce our guest for today. Ashani Hungawata is currently a research assistant for the Urban Fishing Cat Project, but that is only part of a truly incredible story. Ashani has excelled in school her entire academic life, chasing her love for science, a student of the highest and most competitive honors degree program in university. She worked for two years at the National Zoological Gardens in Sri Lanka as a veterinary assistant. She even traveled to Japan in 2018 to present her final year research findings on fish of the Kala Oyo River Basin of Sri Lanka. Despite her remarkable background, it hasn't been easy, but let us hear from her as to why that might be. Because I could go on for days. <laughs> so Ashani, it is a pleasure to have you here. The Urban Fishing Cat Project is absolutely lucky to have you. Um, are you ready to answer some questions for us? Have a chat going? Hi everyone, thanks for joining with us and I hope you will stick around till the last moment. And thank you Dylan for having me here. Yes, go ahead, let's go ahead with the questions. All right, um, so you're young, you're passionate with a history of doing more than most people can fit into an entire lifetime. Um, so as a kid, did you always know that your heart was bound to do science and that you had a love for learning? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, yes. So I had the privilege of growing up in the heart of Canby City, where my house was so close to a forest reserve, as well as I have this beautiful scenery just in front of me, uh, which is a, a huge mountain range. So I think the moment I ever can remember when I was a kid, I fell in love with the nature. Uh, I wake up every day to birds chirping and sun rising behind the mountain. It's just so, so beautiful. I just fell in love with nature and became an ecstatic fan of animals and the nature. So, and my childhood, I was like mostly spending my time outside rather than playing in, indoors or doing video games. I was chasing butterflies, climbing trees. I was always this tomboy who want to, you know, do adventurous things. So. Yeah, as, and as far as my memory goes, I was always curious to learn about animals, their behavior, their movement. So I think I was only afraid of leeches because I had major vermiphobia, but being exposed to them a lot of in the field, I got rid of it. And like most people would be scared of snakes, insects, spiders, whatever, but they always fascinates me. So yeah, I grew up with all these things, watching these things and uh, I started my primary education and secondary education both in Mahamaya Girls College Kandy in Sri Lanka. Uh, <clears throat> so since then science was my favorite subject and with the basic background of all these things I did my advanced level examination in stream of biology with uh, chemistry and physics and uh, despite being a science lover I did so many sports and extracurricular works too. So uh, we had this uh, nature club in our school where I was one of the most active members as usual and I was mostly away from the classroom than being inside the classroom so <clears throat> we had so many quizzes hiking competitions seminars and workshops collaborations with so many other nature clubs in different schools so I think this was my very step out in the field actually being practically engaged something out in the field like such as animal identification bird watching and then also it was like a basic uh, knowledge of learning the survival strategies out in the field like if you get lost what would you do and like you know reading maps compass reading all these things so since then hiking and traveling became one of my passions and uh, as a common quote but like we all conserve what we love so that's where my passion starts so I fell in love with the nature I fell in love with the science and academia so since then, I've been chasing my passion, doing everything I can to 
achieve things and to get where I want to go. So, yeah. So part of your pursuit of that dream has been getting involved in research really early. Um, you know, your first year at the Open University of Sri Lanka, you jumped right into it. So can you tell us what that was like? I mean, what did the research entail? So unlike many students, those who go into their research work at the end of like, like the fourth year or the third year, uh, I started in my freshman year, which was in 2015 in the university. Uh, I started volunteering into this uh, National Institute of Fundamental Studies in Sri Lanka, which is not a part of the university, but a different organization who conducts basically research. So I had the chance to actively engage in two projects under the supervision of Dr. Renuka Ratnayaka. And one project was mapping of soil carbon stock in Nakal forest region in Sri Lanka, where I helped analyzing different fractions of carbon and other nutrition in soil samples. And the other project was biodiesel production from freshwater cyanobacteria of Sri Lanka, where most of my work was based on microbiology. So this was a huge expo experience to me to work in a huge lab. It's just not like a lab in your school or the university. These are like uh, research uh, based organizations. So they have this huge lab, sophisticated, uh, uh, so sophisticated equipments and all these things. So I gained a lot of experience in media preparation, culturing, purification, identification, micro colonies, and then I gained an immense set of lab skills from basic cleaning to avoid contaminations and to working with more sophisticated lab equipment such as centrifuge, spectrophotometer, laminar flow, and then handling microscope. So all these put me far ahead in at the university lab than other students. So it was a really great thing. And so there are days that I will spend like washing more than 100 centrifuge tubes or glassware and sometimes, you know, things tend to break and there are more productive days than the other ones. So it was, it was really good experience to know the responsibility of doing a project. And it's just not the uh, engagement of the work that I actually had, but to know the amount of responsibility, having proper sense to not to burn down a lab, being careful, protecting myself from chemicals. So all these things are way more new and like, Having this exposure was really good and it was a lifetime worth experience for me. And uh, also this was my very first volunteer experience in my life, which I think is an amazing and I'm so grateful for her amazing support and guidance given. And she was since then pushing me into the world of science as a woman. So she was a big encouragement for me at the first stages of my life where I was wondering what to do. So yeah. Well, that's incredible to have such a rich microbiology experience. And then, you know, for, for about two years, you know, while working on your bachelor's, you volunteered as a veterinary assistant at the um, National Zoological Gardens in Sri Lanka. I mean, you dealt with broken limbs, acute infections, animals suffering from parasites, all the fun stuff that comes with veterinary work. So to come from, you know, microbiology to that, can you tell us a little bit more about that side of your experience? You know, what kind of animals did you treat and what was the rehabilitation process like? Yeah, so this is one of my favorite things to talk about and I can go on for days like talking and showing the pictures, but I'll keep it short. So ever since I was a kid, I used to bring these stray animals, cats and dogs, you know, people just abandon animals in the road, which is really sad. So. I used to treat sick animals and rehome them or just bring the stray animals and rehome them. This was like, I was so young when I started doing this, like, and of course my parents understand me better. I, they, they will never kick me out for bringing so many stray animals. I have had so many animals in my home. So um, yeah, that was just the beginning. And then it escalated into treating, uh, you know, the domain the wild animals that comes visit to your home garden such as squirrels birds who are wounded or the abandoned babies so then i started treating such animals with care and if the case was so severe i would take them to the vet i learned most of the things by myself and then i used books and internet to learn as well as when i go to the vet i would ask them what to do in this kind of situation i talk with them and like i learned a lot of things basically doing uh, handling these baby squirrels or birds 
and it was just a really good feeling you have in your heart saving an animal's life you know so yeah we growing up with these experience what i wanted actually got was to become a vet but it did not work out uh, and but you know if life always don't give you what you want but you always have to have a option b or do chase what you love and do what you love uh, whatever the barriers you face so instead of being a vet i focused of on being a zoologist or someone who wants to work with animal i was someone who wants to work with animal somehow so then i changed my thing or the career to become a wildlife conservationist because the same way i would be helping an animal so yeah that's where the basics of my veterinary background and then at the university studying zoology uh, i thought why not volunteer as a veterinary assistant which will give me the same experience and get to work with the animals that i love so i started volunteering at the national zoological garden in sri lanka as a veterinary assistant and <clears throat> having the experience of handling small squirrels expanded to handling more fierce animals such as lions tigers and leopards which was amazing experience and so in these two years i learned how to deal with stress animals how to tranquilize animals what uh, medicines to use how to use blow guns how to treat parasitic gut infections and ticking how to treat tick infestations and provide proper nutrition and vitamin supplements for almost all the captive animals because these captive animals always tend to have so many issues because they are far away from their natural habitat and we have like a lot of exotic animals that does not belong in this environment so we have to care for them so much so yeah uh, i also did the a limb amputation as you said it was a baby monkey and it is just so sad and hard to hard to just go through the process you know the leg was just hanging with a piece of skin and a part of a bone it's just like the baby was screaming is just so sad and yeah and what more uh, i did wound dressings of wallabies i treated an ostrich who had an chronic eye infection you know when you start treating an animal it just knows you are coming to give her the medicine some times they like it sometimes they don't and they really get fond of you with time so it's just undescribable how it feels you know and um, but i treated owls with foot infections and uh, uh, wild horses with skin infections and then orangutans chimpanzees gibbons sloth bears who had so bad tummy issues uh, so we take take their poop samples and analyze them for their parasites and treat them with the needed medication orally or in severe cases we go for iv doses and uh, yeah it's just they are just so smart and tricking them to get oral medication is the hardest one of the hardest part because the moment you look away they just spit it out just like dogs but way more smarter especially these chimpanzees and orangutans they just spit it out so you know you have to make sure they get the medicine into in get into the process of healing so yeah we for tigers i usually pocket up the tablets in small pieces of meat and then give it with a forceps so they would grab it and eat it so but still sometimes they spit it out so you have to go over and over the process and you have to have a lot of patience but you can't be pissed off you know you just spit it out i'm not going to do it in no but you have to do it with love and care and you have to have so much patience as well as respect to the animal you are dealing with it's 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 another living soul not just an animal so you have to treat them with that respect so yeah and you have to know their behavior you have to understand what they love to eat what they would eat on a normal day their feeding schedules all these things to you know give them the proper medication and keep them hydrated monitor the sick animals and yeah i did all these things it was amazing and more i did the uh, x-raying of a limb fracture of a bengal tiger and inserting catheters to the bengal tigers and you have to after you put a catheter you have to take care of it for a long time to avoid urine infections and taking care of a animal in pain especially a carnivorous animal such as a big tiger is not easy you have to protect yourself you have to be so careful because 
they are in pain they are naturally annoyed with everything around them the sounds the vibrations and everything so it's it's just challenging i would say but i just love being part of all these things and the most fun part was caring for young animals when when their mothers reject them or sometimes their mother dies so in such cases we would take the animal and keep them in the nursery and feed them on feeding times uh, it although i say it's fun it's a huge responsibility because you know they can choke it's not their natural feeding method that we are using so they can easily choke they can die so you have to make sure that it does not happen and yeah so i had the opportunity to rear so many bengal tiger babies lion cubs leopard cubs rabbits birds rusty spotted cat otter babies so it was just amazing it was just a nostalgic memory you know it's just great and yeah so and there was this dorkit with a crooked leg she's just so sweet she would always come and talk we, we couldn't really like uh put her with other birds she was just so alone because other birds will attack we have to keep her separated and i started talking with her for a really long time and she actually started mimic my own language like you know say hi and stuff they just learn things so fast it was like and still up to today when i go they remember me she would always talk to me just my voice she would recognize it and talk back with me it's just amazing how animals bond with you and uh, in between field rounds and doing medicines and all uh, we have a kind of a free time so most of my free time i used it to play with two obese fully grown bengal tigers they have big fat bubbles in their belly so which is not good obesity is a common issue in captive animals but you have to you know do enrichment programs make them physically engage in some kind of a work so i used to uh they are inside the cage but still i used to run here and there and they would try to chase me going to this end and that end i would do hide and seek they would so they are like lot physically engaged with me so in that way i was able to reduce some pounds yeah and uh even after even still when i go he still recognize me one actually died other one is still there so still wants to play and she would just come and try to put her hands through the bars and try to grab her grab me and yeah it is just amazing and i'm not even exaggerating like you know they they when you care and love them immensely they just bond with you so much unlike humans they just never you know try to hurt them they know you are there for to do the something good so yeah it's just was an amazing experience and this is just a tiny fraction of my experience there's like so much things and also i did a lot of post mortems which is not fun it's it's the thinking and like it's just not so fun <laughs> yeah to identify what the cause of death we did lot so much um uh post mortems and stuff yeah that is it. such a remarkable diversity of animals and experiences and um I can relate <laughs> with the spitting out the pills because um I've also been a veterinary technician and I also work with uh, big and small cats as well and you know that you've lost the battle when they start smacking their lips and you can see the pill going from side to side yeah. and then poo <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> um so that's that's incredible. I and absolutely you know it's 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 a dreamy experience but it's also like you said a lot of work and a lot of respect you know because these animals are still wild animals and they deserve a lot of respect no matter what you're doing and I, you know if you if you develop that trust and that bond then it's just it's an incredible experience so that's amazing thank you so much for telling us about all of that um so you know despite all of this all of this incredible stuff that we have been talking about your passion your knowledge your skill set people didn't always believe in you simply because you're a woman could you tell us about this and how it impacted you and how you kept going um yeah uh, so you know these moments when you're growing up and when someone asks what is your ambition like mo for most it would be like i want to become a lawyer I, a lawyer i want to become a doctor but for me it was i want to become a vet i want to become a zoologist or sometimes i want to become a natural explorer <laughs> so which is i know 
it's hard to achieve but i hope someday i would be able to you know so all these responses from me what i got back from everyone was like since i i can never remember friends or family not like some in the family and then like uh, you know significant others and their family so you are a, their response was you are a girl how can you be with animals you can't be out there and feel alone uh, with whom are you going to go who's going to accompany you the so all these blah blah typical questions that a asian aunt would ask <laughs> so yeah and everyone doubted me just because i'm a girl and i'm young and uh dealing with all these animals is not so easy and it could end up lead and it eventually ended leading me to self doubt whether if i can really do it but the passion i had to achieve what i love to do just kept on growing and no matter what no one was able to change my mind so i just kept on going chasing my passion and initially i wanted to work about on leopards and snakes but then again the questions arise you can't work on leopards you can't go in not at nights out in the field you can't can you handle snakes how are you going to handle snakes so so much of negativity because you are a girl you can't do this because you are a girl you can't work with these certain animals because it you are a girl you know basically you are a girl so you can't do this so basically according to all these people i was a girl who is incapable of doing anything alone who can't handle any animal who cannot face emergency situations or who is just so fragile and vulnerable but little did they know i have handled so many animals more than any of them i have traveled alone more than any of them i have traveled abroad even alone like especially for a not english speaking country such as japan traveling alone was really challenging so yeah i was i knew by myself that i am capable of doing what i want to do so i just kept on neglecting them and not paying any attention or to get emotionally hurt from them so i always kept my head strong to achieve what i want to achieve and to do what i love so and with years passing i started working and collaboration collaborating with some government bodies as well as college colleagues and which are most of these positions were run by men so and there were so many instances that these people um uh, would neglect my uh, whole experiences or just would just neglect what i would say my ideas just because i'm a girl and the worst is they would steal your idea and present it as their idea and the same crowd will be accepting him for his that idea because it was not coming from a woman so being a woman in this stream is really challenging and yeah you can get a lot of backstabbing you can have a lot of uh, people who envy you and like you know basic human nature of in being someone who achieves things and yeah uh, other than that was it's it's physically challenging for a girl or a boy who it's just physically challenging there are days of good health and bad health i used to get a lot of migraine headaches which is so bad and we are always under the boiling sun or we can we get bitten from hundreds of insects and we so you put your whole body to test their limits you know so it's just physically challenging as well so unless you are prepared to face all these things you actually it is just hard to achieve what you want to achieve so i kept on pushing and you are an always vulnerable to animal attack so you have to know and have to have the common sense to how to protect yourself from all these things and if you are not passionate on what you do if you are not passionate on what you want to achieve you will fail at this point more than the, the mental effects that you get you will fail at the physical challenge first of all and then uh there are moments i have felt so unsafe to work among bunch of men just because they do not know how to treat a woman with respect or they use you know not abusive words i would say but the stupid jokes they would say and you start feeling very unsafe around them so and yeah there are moments i had to travel alone to get things done all by myself so they are challenging and I used to work as a teaching assistant in my university soon after I graduated I worked on several courses uh, <clears throat> that the students were way more older than me some were like 20 30 years older but these men and women sometimes just refused to learn from me just because I'm a young teacher who is also a girl 
teaching them. But I mean, it's just simple stupidity, but you know, you can't help it. Yeah. I would get hurt. I used to get hurt, but understanding the human nature and it's just how it's going to be in this field, I got over it. And like now I just completely do not even care. And I just give less attention to uh, all these things. And as I said, I loved hiking and traveling. And beyond that, I started. I got my scuba diving license, so I'm doing scuba diving as well as a girl. So, uh, in all these things, many have people, so many friends, even very close friends, have judged me. You are a girl. Are you suitable for this? Can you do all these things alone? So, yeah, a lot of questions, sarcastic words, and you know, unwanted jokes that hurts your feelings comes from even your closest people. So it just it just keeps on continuing it won't stop ever so you have to get used to it you have to keep your head strong uh, through all this but and uh also i'm truly grateful for my parents and my brother who is like really understanding and trusting and letting me do whatever i love and what i want to do so it's a blessing to have such parents and like support from the my family it has helped me a lot chasing my passion and keep my head strong in the game and so and it's easy to ne neglect anyone else negative comments because the most people you care about is there for you and supports you so it's a big thing for me so and also uh with all these things i learned to work along men without making unwanted issues and to get things done the way i want and every person has their own personality so unless you study them and learn to tackle them it will always be hard for you to do things as a woman so you got to be tricky. You got to tackle the challenges your own way because each situation is so unique. I can't pinpoint and say you have to do this at this situation. It's just so unique. You have to understand and deal with it. And you have to also know your way is not the only way. So you have to learn, learn to listen, to talk, to communicate properly with everyone to avoid issues out in the field. So I learned all these things working with so many people out there. And yeah so just keep your head straight being a woman just do what you want to do neglect everything else who give the negative comments well thank you so much for sharing that part because i think that's really important for a lot of people because you're not alone in that trend and i think it's really admirable that you can keep a clear head and keep going because it's not easy to brush that stuff off you know we're all human so um, it's impressive and good for you. Keep going. You've already done so much. So obviously your um, background speaks for itself. So, um, you know, you've graduated with your degree, you're launching into the world to start your own life, your own project, follow your own career. Um, uh, we did have a question on Facebook and I think this relates to this one. Where do you see yourself in a couple of years? And do you plan on staying in Sri Lanka with, you know, whatever you do? So, I doing all this volunteer work and extracurricular stuff. I graduated with a first class majoring in zoology. So this was a four years degree, which opened up the opportunity for me to go for it as a direct PhD student. So as I said, I love going in the academic field as well. So I thought I want to pursue my PhD as soon as possible. So I have already applied and waiting for responses. So if I get to start my PhD this year or maybe next year, it would actually consume three to five years of my life. So I will be fully engaged in studies rather than in the field work in this period. And in if any case, the PhD is delayed, I would continue to work with Urban Fishing Cat Project and under Small Cat Advocacy and Research, I want to start my own projects. I do not want to elaborate on the, what the projects are because they are still proposals and ideas. But yeah, it's basically focusing on conserving small wild cats in Sri Lanka. And after pursuing my PhD in a couple of years, if the opportunity comes, I want to engage in academia while being on the field. Uh, yeah, so many people, wildlife lovers, focus on charismatic species such as leopards, elephants, and there are many important species that are given less attention, but as vulnerable as and also valuable to the environment just as an apex predator or an elephant. So I want to engage myself in work with these less charismatic species and work toward their conservation. Even me personally, I said I wanted to work on lepers, but uh, the, that mentality has drastically changed understanding more about wildlife concepts and 
yeah, so I think I will focus more on less charismatic species. And also I want to expand my studies mostly towards genetics and molecular aspects of conservation, especially addressing population structures, adaptive potential and evolution and the landscape genetics, that kind of thing. So yeah, uh, and there are so many research gaps to fulfill them and uh, that is important, but research itself is not going to address all the conservation issues or solve the conservation issues. So I want to have more collaborations and work with many people as much as I can and to make a platform just as more cat advocacy and research to newcomers to work with us and work along uh, to get a better result. And uh, yeah, as I said, uh, it's just not research and conservation. You have to understand the social factors, the economic factors causing all these conservation is issues. So if you go and tell a farmer or, or a person not to poach or hunt animal, it is not going to happen because we have to have a solution for them. We have to provide them with a better understanding, talk to them with a better understanding. We have to sit and talk with them and understand what causes them to do these things. So it's, it's just not conservation. It's just more community work. It's just engaging with them as being in their shoes and understanding what their problems are and trying to find solutions for those things. I think in coming years, I would engage myself more into community work as well as research. That's great because that's one of the biggest, you know, things that the Fish and Cat Conservation Alliance emphasizes is community work. If you don't have that, it's like a three-legged, you know, chair. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, and, you know, kind of on that note, there are quite a few of our followers and supporters um, of the Fish and Cat Conservation Alliance that are young students that are also launching into the field of wildlife and it can be intimidating as you know it can be difficult to determine like, where do i start how do i start um we, could you i suppose narrow down on the most important things to you for people to remember that are interested in pursuing the same career as you that might be helpful for them as they get going uh, well, yes, it was just the same for me. And I do not come from a background where my family, anyone in my family is engaged in wildlife or biology. So almost everyone was in the IT field or the finance sector. So for me, I had to find my own things, find my own contacts, build up my own connections. So it was not easy for me at all. And I know having a degree is worth it and your education background, research background, all is worth it having but I didn't know anything about getting engaged in research and conservation out in the field so I also was in a point where I was receiving so much negativity from people saying that this suits for a man than a woman so your 20s you are just this it's just full of crossroads where you wonder what to do what to do how to achieve things you want to achieve uh, how to you are in a lot of self-doubt with people's comments and like you are when everything is seemingly at stake it's just it's just not easy so uh it will you will have to chase your passion always and there are moments of uncertainty what to do what to do next so this please where in my life i met anya the co-founder of small cat advocacy and research whom i currently work with uh, i met her at her in country conference and she did this amazing presentation on fishing cats and i was just amazed because fishing cats just live in my back, in backyard you know i live very close close to the forest so i was like wondering she's a woman and she's doing all these things and why can't i do so i talked with her and ever since i've been like bothering her <laughs> and we will be talking all the time and we we are now working together so yeah, so I said I was passionate about working on leopards, but she, and like there is so much negativity around me. So she taught me a lot on how to deal with these things and how to neglect the negativity and just chase what you want to do and guided me throughout engaging in the research world other than academia, because I was just so focused on my academics. I did not know what to do outside of it. So yeah, and I, since 2015, I started volunteering in urban fishing cat project on and off because with my studies and everything else, I had very little time to engage in it. So 
Yeah, and uh, since then, uh, so I would say like best thing I would suggest is talk to people, connect with people and volunteer as much as you can. And don't be afraid to reach out, you know, you there will be always opportunities for you. And other, when you don't talk, you would know if there are opportunities at all or not. And like, yeah, so uh, and the most asked questions is, do you get paid doing all these things? No, you would not. But the experience is far more worth for your lifetime to build up your career, to build up your character, to build up your ethics in work. So, and also if you are volunteering, just check if the organization is a well-established legal one, because there are so many out there that is just not legal, just doing it for the sake of getting money. So yeah, and also don't fear the rejection. Like you can write 10 emails and get rejected all the time, but that's okay because there are so many other things to do. So don't fear rejection. Just talk, if they say no, they don't have an opportunity, that's fine, go for another thing. So I have, I myself have got rejected so, from so many volunteer opportunities that were out there, but I don't regret it. I have done so much things and I have chased my passion. So yeah, the, and uh, always balance your education and extracurricular work. Although I was like volunteering and doing so many things, I was having really good grades and got a first class so I can go for my PhD. And people, different people come from different background. And if you do not want to continue in academics, that is fine. If you are a photographer, if you are, an, if you are good at art, if you are good at drama, use that as your tool. If you are a photographer, address the conservation is issues, talk to people's heart through your photograph. If you are an artist, talk, use your arts as your media to uh, reach your people. And the most famous thing these days, TikTok, if you love TikTok, just use TikTok to reach out to people with the conservation issue and like, you know, do what you do the best so you know you can get a better outcome of it so for me i did what i do the best and i have reached so far so don't bother like if you don't want to continue academics if you don't want to to you know do research and engage yourself in like writing grants all these things but but there are so many ways if you are a writer be a content creator or if you write a book write a journal there are so many ways to reach the people out there as a conservationist or people someone who loves wildlife so as i said when you love something you will conserve it so make people fall in love with nature make people fall in love with animals then that way they would actually make an effort to protect these things and conserve these things and there will always be heartbreaks, failures, disappointment, and negativity. So just it's just a moment. Let it pass away. It will always pass away, and better moments will come. So, uh, and me personally, I do not like working in office or under pressure. But it doesn't mean I do not get pressure now. I just, I still do, but still I'm doing something I love. So it's not it does not bother me at all. Even I'm stressed. Stress is <laughs> it does not bother me at all. So. There are so many opportunities out there. Seek for them, talk to people, and take your CV, check it out on every six months and see what you have added. May it be a workshop, may, be, may it be a one month volunteer experience, may it be your own project, anything. So all these things adds up experience far more and make your pathway to reach your goals. And it's, it's just amazing once you start chasing your passion and do anything to get there. It, things will just fall on your way, you know, one, one door will close, but another will always open up. So, yeah, and I can't just pinpoint and say, do this and do that, but like, do what you do the best. That's my best advice to give. And girls especially need to have the sense to protect their, themselves from certain situations and to be independent. And the more you rely on someone to get things done, is the more harder your life will be. So, Never limit yourself and step out of your comfort zone and chase what you love, like I did. And you will always succeed. I guarantee that you will always succeed. And if someone says, you're a woman, you can't do this, tell them just, damn right, I'm a woman and I will prove you wrong, but make sure you will prove them wrong. Otherwise they will laugh at you. <laughs> well, thank you. That is really, really helpful for so many different reasons. Um, 
there are so many incredible women on the Fish and Cat Conservation Alliance team that um, completely blow me away. And I think also what you said about networking, that is easier said than, than done, you know, a lot of the times, because sometimes if you reach out to somebody, they won't answer, or they say they're not available or something like that. And you're right, you have to kind of take those failures. But to be persistent and even sitting down and figuring out how to draft that first email can be challenging. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, to have people like Anya where you could ask as many questions as you need to, to figure out how to navigate this um, kind of complicated field is really helpful. Um, do you do have another question for you is, what was one of your most memorable moments for all of your work and your volunteer experience that made you realize you wanted to keep doing what you're doing? Was there one like, memory you go oh yeah that's that's probably what it was that drove me forward if you can think of anything it's hard to answer like everything as i said my passion started when i started treating wild animals and bringing home stray animals because i was just so passionate to you know to love them to care for them and like to conserve them so yeah that's just like a very starting point and then it just keeps on growing and growing you know it's and like most memorable like yes veterinary assistant experience was a great experience i will like remember it forever and like the bonds i have with these animals it's just amazing yeah and yeah it must have been hard to leave <laughs> after it doing is, that but I had to because with everything else now I live a little too far from the zoo I don't get to visit the zoo as much as I did before I'm not a fan of zoo or the captive animals but I made their lives better at some point so it's just a big self-satisfaction you know but whenever I get a chance I would go visit them talk to my lorikeet or the tiger so it's just it's just still keeps on going when it's also to um, for people to connect and relate and be inspired mm -hmm. by these education programs and the funding that they generate from from doing these outreach is we are really, really grateful to that. <laughs> um, and so I want to thank you so much for speaking with us today for sharing your story, um, as well as you know the challenges that hit you along the way it's been an absolute pleasure. And I really look forward to seeing what you do in the future. You know, you're you're launching right now, so it'll be it'll be fun to see where where you go and what you do. Um, the Urban Fish and Cat Project will miss you <laughs> if you decide, you know, to study abroad or wherever you go. But nonetheless, the whole team is proud of you. Um, and I want to thank the entire um, everybody that's watching right now for for joining us too, for asking good questions and anything you'd like to add, Ashani. Um, not really just just chase, chase your past passion and do what you love do what you do the best that way you will achieve more than doing something someone else pushes you to do so keep that in mind right and the the theme there too be creative because yes a lot of a lot of the people on our team are filling gaps that haven't been filled and so that makes us stronger and it it helps the fishing cat it helps other wildlife it helps people um, yeah. So I, that's, yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. That's one of the most important is be creative. So thank you guys so much. Um, we look forward to another interview for our webinar series. And um, although Fish and Cat February is over, <laughs> we can still enjoy the Fish and Cat and we're gonna keep sharing, you know, project updates with you. And um, thank you all so much for your artwork. Keep it up because it's beautiful. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Ashani. And I think thank that's you. it for today. Thank, thank you, you guys for being here with us. <laughs> Bye. Bye.